so, uh, so we've got two special guests here tonight. Um, first thing I want to say is just th thanks everyone for coming. Uh, you know, it's one of those, you know, events like this are ones where you have a lot of things pulling at your time. And I know that everyone had to make some decision to not do something else to come here. And so I just really appreciate the fact that you guys chose this one. Uh, we've got two very special people here tonight. Uh, what, one person I would say is one of the most influential uh, names and thinkers uh, in the cloud native ecosystem and, and Kubernetes specifically. Uh, and the other person, uh, you can guess who it is. And the other, and the other person uh, is responsible for turning Do Docker into the behemoth that it is today. And we're very, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe both are involved in that. Uh, so tonight we've got uh, Kelsey Hightower and Scott Johnson, and, and they're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the cloud native ecosystem, Kubernetes, and, and of course some of the cool things going on in WebAssembly. Uh, and if I could just ask everyone to turn the volume down a hair. Hey, if you see someone who's talking, just tap them on the shoulder and just kind of say, hey, take, take it down a, a notch. And, and, if, and if you're talking, just take another drink. Just keep doing that. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to these guys. And uh, maybe we'll take like, everyone can take like uh, eight steps forward. C come a little bit closer. All right, there we go. That's probably this is probably good right here. <laughs> keep keep it coming, keep it coming. No one wants to feel like they're in an empty room. Awesome. Well, again, thank thank you all for being here. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Everyone has multiple things they can do, and you chose this, and that's great. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, the main event. All right. Bup, 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 bup. Get it. I gotta find, yeah, that's not working. All right. uh, like, you can be respectful and please be quiet for a moment. Please be respectful and be quiet for a moment. If you can try that, you're outside. We're not on a Zoom call. There's no mute button. We can hear you. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna try today is uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. You know, Docker being invested to by the VCs that put this on. We're going to talk about why Docker made the decision they did to talk about WASM. I'm going to also make audible, I'm going to take questions from you all as well. And we're going to talk about this trend that's happening in the cloud native space. Look, a lot of you are all attending KubeCon. My mic is going in and out, so I'm pretty sure the minutes are rented on these microphones. So we, <laughs> we got to use them carefully. Uh, Scott, if you can, introduce yourself way back to our, whoa, 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 this is... This is hard. Can you we might have to just shout. Yeah. Try, try the mic. Here, you might have to use my mic. Oh. Here, here, I'll give you my mic. There you go. All right, does this is better? It's not better. It's, it's you, Kelsey. I don't know if it's the mic. Is it you or the is mic? It, is it me? I don't know. Is it Kelsey or the mic? All right, let's try this. Okay, I'll learn how to use a microphone. <laughs> I haven't done this before. Scott, introduce yourself. Yeah. Let people know what you're working on and what you're up to. Scott, I work at Docker. What's your job? Oh, you're a backend engineer. Uh, deckhand. I'm a deckhand at Docker. So Scott is the CEO of Docker. We go back to our days at Puppet, 2012, 2013. I was working with this person. He was leading a lot of the product vision at Puppet Labs during the dawn of DevOps. And we were really trying to turn the things that people were doing in the DevOps community into tooling that you can do, even if your team wasn't full of DevOps experts. And now he's at Docker. You're at driving the ship? Well, and it was at Puppet where we discovered Docker, yes. right? Because we were really sensitized to the notion, as you, if you remember, kind of Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt, right? We were all trying to keep environments consistent between servers on the, on the ops side, but also between dev and servers, between uh, the dev and the ops side. And so we were paying attention to DocCloud and the PaaS. And so DocCloud open sources this thing, Docker, March 2013. And literally like three months later, Docker starts showing up in our Puppet accounts. And I was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and do you remember we couldn't say Docker in the office? You couldn't say Docker in the office because, like, that was a verboten, verboten, sorry, German speakers. Like, that was just forbidden, right? But I came back to the Docker office's CEO, and I said, like, this is going to change everything. 
didn't want to hear it. So I came into Docker in February 2014. All right, so, so we're going to jump into it. You had an announcement recently. And Docker recently announced support for Wasm. Wasm is hot right now. People are trying to use Wasm for everything. COVID cures, <laughs> cancer cures. I'm not sure that's what Wasm is for. Student debt, student debt as well, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, student I, debt. <laughs> yeah. And then you had this announcement that you're going to be supporting it. Number one, what is that support? And look, I'm going to be honest with you. I looked at Hacker News. People are a little confused. Why is Docker doing this? Give us some clarity. Yeah, all right, thank you, Kelsey. So look, when, when we kicked off this industry, right, when we democratized this in 2013, we started with Linux containers. We then, as a community, standard on OCI, OCI for build, share, and run, brought that same standardization to Windows containers, 2016, 2017. Then we brought it more recently to serverless, Amazon Lambdas. 25% of Amazon Lambdas are deployed as OCI containers, right? true fact. And we saw in the upstream WASM community, this is before Docker had any sort of inclination or, or ambition, we saw the WASM community trying to hack Docker, fork the different projects, use container D, use build kit to create WASM objects, WASM artifacts. We're like, what's that all about? And when we talk to them, we talk with some of the end users, it's like, look, we've already invested in this OCI tool chain. We've already invested in Docker Desktop and CI and the deployment targets. They pick up OCI and they run OCI runtimes. Like, is there a way, is there a way that we could evolve the OCI infrastructure standards to support another artifact? You're already supporting multiple artifacts. Let's support this other one, this WASM one. So we looked at that and we said, you know what, if that helps make it more accessible to more users, such that the experimentation and the feedback loops accelerate, that's worth us investing in. And so we spent, what Justin, we spent like six months, several engineers working with the community, working with partners who came forward with, with ideas of like how to make it uh, standards-based. And we created this shim within ContainerD called RunWASI, which then can shim out to any Wasm Runtime. We work with fantastic partner, uh, Wasm Edge, Second State. I don't know if they're here tonight. And we put it out there of like, let's just help make more users, make this more accessible to more users with their existing tool chains. So they didn't have to do a rip and replace. They didn't have to do a forklift upgrade. And in doing so, did we get it perfect? Probably not. In fact, odds are that we didn't get it perfect. But at least we get more users in the conversation, more feedback coming to the Wasm community. And we can figure out kind of where to go from here. So that's why we did it, and that's, that was the, that's what the announcement was all about. Now, for those that, how many people here think they understand what WASM is? I'm not talking about watching a YouTube video. <laughs> Reading three blog posts ain't gonna cut it. So I'm not an expert at all, but I have to work to understand it. And so for me, what were people doing before WASM is the thing that I tried to understand. If you had a web server like Nginx, then you probably had embedded Lua support. You had this runtime, so your community didn't have to write C++ or C or whatever it's written in to extend that thing. And why would that make sense? I just need to manipulate an HTTP request, no problem. I just need a little tiny runtime. I don't need a whole computer, I don't need a whole kernel. And I can do this manipulation at runtime. Imagine you're Cloudflare, and you want to do this across your entire CDN stack. You could use Lua, but the browser has demonstrated that there is a better isolation model that's super fast. And thanks to the fact that multiple languages, JavaScript, Golang, Rust, you have choices now that can now generate these WASM modules, binaries, however you want to think about them. And now you have, in my opinion, you have a new computer. And this computer doesn't implement everything the Linux syscall does. It feels like Java, but it's slightly different, has a different use case. And it's very appealing for that. Now, why Docker do, does this is that if you all know how technologists work, you see a hammer, everything becomes a? Yeah. And boy, oh boy, are people trying to take their existing apps and shove them into Wasm. It looks real good on your LinkedIn profile. But does it match reality? And I think to, to your point, Scott, we've seen people trying to build these things. You need a clean build environment. So Docker is a build tool, already does that. You need a way to distribute these things. At the end of the day, there's still some binary blob that spits out 
Are we going to recreate zip files the way Lambda did? Or do we think about using OCI as a standard packaging mechanism and doing that instead? So on the surface, it definitely makes sense to me, and we should probably get into it tonight, how far are we going to go with this? Does Docker over time move away from x86 and ARM and normal Linux binaries, and is it going to be WASM forever, or is this a and conversation? That's the question to you, Scott. I mean, look, we've, we've all been in this industry and we've seen techs come and go and like, I think as soon as you position yourself as like, oh, it's only this, like it's an or, you better be delivering 10x, 100x better performance if you're going to force everyone to throw out what they're using, right? And I think because this is a nascent state of, of the WebAssembly industry, like, let's bring it in and have an and conversation of like, where does this make sense? How do your existing tools help you be effective in delivering these objects for those use cases and and then listen and listen and open up the community and listen that's how we got started in this and that's how honestly if you look at the containers it feels very similar to containers in 2013 2014 before the standards sort of settled down where there's multiple different run there was LX, you know this there's lxc and there's a bunch of other ways to run containers in 2013 2014 this is it feels very similar right and so rather than dictate too early like it's one way or this way like let's just let's just help others get into the conversation and figure out what makes sense from a, what problems are we solving? What use cases can we enable standpoint? So I don't think it's an or, I think it's an and right now. So this moves Docker into this multi runtime territory for the first time, right? There was, there was, there was hints around unikernels back in the day. I remember that whole movement. We know how Linux binaries work. Is this now a so, multi-runtime so scenario? Is that a difference of degree or difference of kind, right? Because I would say that the container D work, I think there's some container D folks here. Give us give a round of applause for the container D folks here, right? Talk about great technology standard. Underneath container D, there are a number of run C modules that handle runtimes very differently depending on use case, right? There's the firecracker stuff, right? There's Windows containers. Thank you, Justin Cormack, our Docker CTO. Um, I, IBM, uh, not 360s, 390s, right? S390s are running Docker, right? So there's a number of different runtimes out there all underneath the OCI build, share, and run standards. And so we see this as a difference of degree. Like, let's add another to the existing suite of runtimes that all support this standard. Awesome. So, look, we have a lot of people here. If you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. I'll run this mic to you. Introduce yourself, ask your question. We don't want to hear about your crypto project if you got one. <laughs> we, we, we want to stay focused with it. Hold on. Hi, my name is Vladimir, EPUM Systems. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, Scott. Uh, so uh, let's reflect a little bit. 20 years ago, uh, there was virtualization big thing, right? After that, there came public cloud. After that, Docker and then Kubernetes. Now we're talking about WebAssembly. Is that really next big thing that we should jump on to be ahead, or there is, or it's not yet? I mean, I think it depends on what your resume looking like. <laughs> right. What does what your LinkedIn resume say? What does your GitHub profile say? Look, I think all these waves, like you can find folks who say like, go now, it's, it's the thing and let's jump on it. And you can also find those that will say, no, nah, you know, it's a fad, it's running out. And I think those of us who've been through multiple waves, it's like, no one has a crystal ball, right? So how do you make just enough investment in the community, in the tech, in your company to get in the game and listen? And how can you constructively move things ahead? So this, this actually came up earlier today. So recall, those of us who are around, recall 2013, 2014, 2015, right? Like containers were like, it was crazy, balkanized and fragmented and lots of conversations. And then as a community, as a community, we said, all right, OCI is it for build, share and run. And all of a sudden, if you look at the explosion, the Cambrian explosion around CNCF in terms of projects and companies and startups, that Cambrian explosion was affected by that standardization. And we are not yet there for WebAssembly, right? We got a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of back and forth. I would project that as the standards settle down, we'll see a Cambrian explosion of creativity and innovation on WebAssembly. And that's the time you say like, ah, okay, this is something that we can ride and bet on. 
Now, there's startups that are dedicated to this that are already riding and betting on it. 100% admire the, are you a, what is it? Are you a, a pig or a chicken, right? Are you contributing or are you all in and committed? Pigs are committed, right? Chickens are just, you know, giving the eggs. So, so there's, there's some in the room who are fully committed. God bless, right? That's fantastic. And that's how these industries move ahead. Um, I think we'll see even more innovation as standards settle down and kind of open up different parts for different startups and different players to play. Yeah, I think about it as um, on the platform side, the Lua use case. We're starting to see a lot of extensibility in the network. And so the reason why Wasm, I think, is perfect for this is that we're starting to move a lot of logic to the network. But we don't need to move it all to the network. We need to do just enough. And so Wasm has already proven itself in the network in our browsers. Every tab allows people to run untrusted code, AKA JavaScript, shit's kind of dangerous too. And if it can handle JavaScript, then we're, on, we're off to a good start. So taking that security sandbox out of the browser and put it into these other layers where we found that we can actually run untrusted code safely side by side, I definitely think you're going to enhance existing platforms. Why is this exciting? Because before, if you log into Cloudflare and you become a customer, you can only use five or six or 10 features that they have. But the truth is they need a lot more extensibility than their engineering team will ever build. So imagine opening up an API that's wide enough to create an ecosystem of functionality that you can now run in the CDN itself. That's a beautiful thing and I can see that carrying on, but that's a remix of where we were. That makes a lot of sense. The other side is I think Scott alluded to it, is Java gonna take over everything? Is Golang going to take over everything? Every time a new language comes out, it tries to do everything. I've seen people try to run Swift on the server side. Like people try this every single time. So you take a new language, it has some nice properties probably for a targeted use case, and then people wanna use it for everything. I was having conversations with people who I do consider Wasm effort, uh, experts. I think they are fully aware of the sweet spot. I think Wasm takes care of that. Then yes, you're gonna have this new, uh, I think secure sandbox that's easier to lock down than starting from a wide open kernel and then removing things until you get there. I think that's gonna work. And some people will write what feels like traditional style apps in that limited sandbox and it will look just like any other container. You can put Go in there, you can put Haskell in there, or you may put this Wasm runtime thing in there. Some people may say it defeats the purpose, but you may wanna start in that paradigm. I think that's where we're at today. Where we take it, I don't know if we're gonna figure out one paradigm for all of computing needs because we never seem to, right? Every time we come up with a standard, we just now have 700 programming languages to choose from, right? So I think there'll probably be another one, but I don't see the other ones going away. Um, I'm gonna pivot back to Scott. If you all have a question, think about that question. Raise your hand, I'll pass you the mic. I'm gonna continue on to Scott here. Um, oh, we do have an extra oh, you got an extra mic? Woo, we paid extra. <laughs> Scott, in terms of developer productivity, you know, you got developers that are looking at this new paradigm, trying to figure out how these things live side by side. How do you think this from a content perspective? We talked about plugins now becoming a target for what people are building. How does Docker Hub and all the existing developer tools that you have fit into this model? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think it's, it's super early, but just as an example, um, before even this announcement, we had like some 450, 500 WASM objects already up on Hub. So the community already figured out like, hey, if I just package this as an OCI thing, I can push and pull and share, right? And so I think that shows that within the community, and the Docker Hub today, you know, 14 million different rep repository registries, uh, sorry, repositories and applications, and you know, 15 billion downloads a month. Meaning like the ability to share your work, right, within the community is a very powerful, par powerful paradigm. So I think what we're gonna see is as the component model of WASM settles down, and as you're able to distribute those components as OCI objects, that that's just gonna continue to accelerate and explode. Because sharing and reusing work is, I mean, uh, hold WebAssembly aside for a second, like some 90% of all applications today are built from open source components. And the, the new original code that's added for the application is like 5%, 10%, 15% at most, right? And so um, we'll see the same, I predict we'll see the same uh, wave coming through WASM where you'll have a bunch of library standardized components that developers will use to plug and play and assemble their application. And then of course, add their own originality, their own IP on top of that. 
And so that means like, okay, how do you know what component is trusted? How do you know if it's supported? How do you know if it's gonna be updated? How do you know if it's fresh? Has it been scanned, right? All of that. And so everything that we're, all the workflow and all the, the tooling that we're providing for containers today is absolutely applicable, I believe, for the WebAssembly world that's coming very, very soon. And I think we saw that. I remember like three years ago when I really started to get deep, maybe even four years ago, it was all about serverless. If y'all rewind the clock four or five years ago, people was like, dude, everything's going to be serverless. And I was feeling real bad. I'm over here with my Kubernetes book. Like, damn, am I already updated? <laughs> I saw this kid. He came up to me. He's like, yeah, we don't do legacy containers anymore. I'm like, legacy? <laughs> <laughs> do you know where you at? This KubeCon. <laughs> we revoke your badge over here. And then I was like, I think, and I remember I tweeted this, I predict that Lambda will eventually realize zip files ain't the way, and they will probably understand that Docker and Docker runtime are two different things. This thing with layered way of packaging and distributing applications or whatever you want should be something that Lambda considers. And I remember that reinvent when they said they can support OCI images in Lambda. Oh my God, I was finding people on Twitter, it's like you. Remember that thing you said? Take that. <laughs> so I think that distribution model has already came true in a whole nother paradigm where people thought it was a or discussion, where it was serverless or containers. And now that discussion at least gone on the runtime side or the packaging side. Exactly right. Like, like all of these are ways to implement services. And yet the services work together to develop an end user experience, to deliver an end user experience, to deliver an application. And again, a shameless shill for the Monday demo that, that Cormac and team showed was they had two Linux containers mixed with a WASM object, but all the communication was at the service level. It's all API to API. So is that implemented as a Linux container? Is that implemented as a WASM object? Is that implemented as a service object? Is that implemented as a hosted database as a service? You know, to the developer, it shouldn't matter. I'm just assembling these services to create an end user experience. All right. Anyone got a next question here? Because I think there's another part of this whole WASM discussion that there is going to be an opportunity to, to create, and I just use the term, a new computer. And that thing may challenge the way we think about file systems. It may challenge the way we think about protocols. It may challenge the way we think about distributing things. And so to give the WASM community credit, that opportunity is still there, that we may end up doing something different. Like when I think about mobile devices, that feels like an entirely different programming paradigm. The SDKs lend themselves to it. I've never seen people run Puppet on their iPhone. There's someone in here probably doing that. Your battery life is probably terrible. <laughs> All right, so do we have any other questions, right? People are here, WASM, Docker, where things are going. Any question is open. We're both here. Raise your hand. We'll get a mic over to you. All right, we got one right here in the front. Uh, introduce hey. yourself, ask your question. Hi, I'm Brett Fisher. I talk on the internet for a living. Um, <laughs> so, SJ, with your, with, I, I assume you had design partners or, or companies that you were kind of seeing and working with a little bit. Are, are you seeing particular workflows that they're having, or like workloads, sorry, not workflows, workloads that you're seeing that they're gravitating to, to using Docker as the, the WASM container object? Yeah, that's a great question, Brett. And it's super early, but what, what we've seen across the, you know, broad three categories of, of WASM use cases of you know, server-side, edge, and browser. Um, we're seeing our, our workflow and the outputs from that being really aligned with the edge use case. And so uh, and this is coming from partner conversations as well as end user conversations when they're trying to use it in their own environments, in their, in their, own, um, in their own worlds. And I think the reason is twofold. One is, um, on the server side, there's a lot of great work going on, but the server side for, for WASM runtimes is still single-threaded, right? And so that's got to get double-threaded. I would, I would project that it has to get double-threaded before it's able to take um, heavier or more significant server-side workloads. And then on the browser side, most of the Docker developer community is a, is a server-side community. There's, there's some, there's some front-enders in there, but most of the, the, the lion's share and the, the center of gravity is on the server side. And so, frankly, our community does not understand the browser or the client side as well. And so, um, in our conversations with what we're doing as we've been on this journey for the last 12 months, um, it's been like more focused on that, that edge use case, more so than the browser use case or the server use case. 
So that's where we are today. We're going to learn a lot with this announcement and the feedback we're going to get from it. And it's also been a good lightweight way for multi-tenancy. You know, this concept that I can run this untrusted code and make sure it doesn't cross any of the boundaries. We know that that's been hard to do with the Linux kernel. There's so many layers to try to get right. And if one of them goes wrong, all of it goes out the window. So I think people are really liking this idea, even for more traditional light workloads. This, this promise of multi-tenancy is really attractive for a lot of folks. So I'm seeing a lot of people gravitate towards that. Even if they're not looking for the plug-in system or the other model, this is why I think a lot of people are paying hyper attention right now for that. Any other questions, raise your hand and we'll get a mic over to you. Right, right here in the middle. Hey Scott, how are you? My name is Naor from Firefly. I have a question about the browser side WASM. So do you think that developers and just in general, you know, looking at the architecture of future applications will leverage WASM to offload compute to the client side and even security controls or something like that? Well, I think the answer is already yes. I mean, that's the sweet spot. Like for me, I'm actually allergic to JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that makes, means that I don't have to write JavaScript, I'm all in. And we look at these architectures, for example, I was just at the Vercello uh, User Summit the other day, and this is exactly what's happening, right? So when you think about some of these components on the front end, you may be using the React-based model that's going out to pull data from different areas, but now with this WASM layer, you can actually have people drop functionality in various languages or some WASM compatible thing, and then in that situation, you can decide, does it run in the browser? Does it run in your CDN? Or do you push it all the way back into a serverless platform that supports a WASM native runtime? So I think we're already seeing that. So yes, the browser for sure. I think the exciting part is doing it beyond the browser. If you look at rich web applications like Gmail, the first one, written in Java, not written in JavaScript, compiled to JavaScript. And that was, you know, that's been the route for a long time. And WASM is just the, a better way of doing that. There's a lot of people happy that they may not have to write JavaScript right now. <laughs> Are you one of those? Or you have a question? No. no. You're, you're happy. No JavaScript. You're happy not to write JavaScript. Excellent. Excellent. Question? Right here in the, in the middle. Luke? Uh, so Scott alluded earlier about the, uh, the parallel to containers in 2013, 2014. And Kelsey, you've spent a lot of time in early container, in the container wars, explaining what Kubernetes was, and explaining containers, and explaining how different pieces fit together. What do you see in the WebAssembly ecosystem today that humans and companies in that space should do to talk about this in a more clear and a way that makes sense for developers and for other people involved in the ecosystem? I'm going to tell you why I think Kubernetes was super simple or successful, including Docker. Those two things, people already had those problems. All I needed was three minutes. Show me you to build your Python app. Aha, virtual inf. Build a Node.js app. Ah, you're downloading the whole internet every time. <laughs> and so when you watch a developer run out of disk space on their $3,000 MacBook, they're going to be looking for a better way ASAP. And then when you just show them Docker build, they get it. Isolated environment, reproducible build. I'm on board with this. They got it immediately. We didn't ask them to write a different app. We said to take the same app we're going to give you a way to actually do what you're doing in a repeatable way. And actually, we didn't even ask them to do a different language. If you had a make file or a bash script, put it right there in the Docker file and continue on. And everyone has already had experience of distributing applications, whether it's SCP or whatever. Kubernetes comes along. How did I explain it? Show me how you're deploying today. You create a bunch of VMs, and you'd be surprised how many people are tracking spreadsheets. And I would always ask the developers and operations teams and the platform members and say, do you know what a scheduler is? And they would say, no. I said, that means you're the scheduler. <laughs> right? You go to the spreadsheet, Optimus Prime dash US5. Yes. You got that IP address and you assign it the web server. If that goes down, then you move the web server three cells down in the spreadsheet and you hit enter, right? And so that's what people were doing. And so when you showed them Kubernetes, it's like Kubernetes and Docker were essentially checkpoints on the last decade of people who had already figured this out, we just turned that into shared vocabulary 
a tool you can actually use. And I think it just caught on because we didn't have to explain it. We just had to show it and show people the dialect to move back and forth. The Docker file and the Kubernetes manifest was a way to encode your knowledge into a shared thing, configuration. When we talk about WASM, I think we're talking about multiple things. We're really, in some ways, in my understanding, is we're talking like a better elf binary for most people. If you just say WASM alone and you look at it, it's like it's a different binary. Now what? What's the orchestration layer? Are we even talking about orchestration? So I think a lot of people are getting confused. Like in many ways, Chrome is an orchestration layer for the web. Control T, new tab. Copy and paste between them. It gives them resources and the sandbox things. So Chrome is to WASM what Kubernetes is to containers. But when we just talk about WASM by itself, you're making people guess and assume Context. all the other layers. So if you want to do a better job, you have to approach it to the problem. If I'm a security professional, I'm like, yo, we need to have an extension to our SaaS product. How should I do that? Should I work my way from kernel up and try to lock it down? Or should I embrace WASM and just make the trade-off that maybe some system calls shouldn't be used? We got to do that. Target the use case and then talk about how the technology can help and then be honest. Right now, some people are like, WASM will eventually do everything. It's like, how long is eventually? <laughs> you know what I mean? So what does WASM do today? Be very specific. Give me some code examples. I also like negative examples. Here's a thing that WASM doesn't do. And that would help people from spinning their tails and, and trying to do too many things there. So that's my opinion. And then also talk about how WASM relates to the current things that people are using. So even though I saw that Hacker News post where people were scratching their heads, why is Docker talking about WASM? The truth is that workflow piece that Docker had already solved, that's something that people were just guessing in the WASM community before. And so the way you talk about it is like that press release. Here's the thing that you have, here's the world that you already have, and here's how those dots connect. What Kelsey said. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do a quick time check. I'm not sure how much time, because we wanna leave time for networking. Anyone that is running the clock, how much time do we have? Wrap it up. You did that real smooth, you was like, that's was that, it. Was that, was that? Like the oh, Oscars. Yeah, we gotta wrap up? Okay. One last question. All right, one last question. So Larry Carvalho with Robust Cloud, who do you see as the winners and losers as you could foresee with the knowledge you have now in the next three to five years with WASM? Just as a... For WASM? So, wow. That's so a... what WASM will do to the ecosystem, to the cloud area, where, where do you see the winners and losers? This is crystal ball time, right? So it's like, <laughs> all right, who is foreseeing the future? Look, Kelsey, Kelsey and I said similar threads, which is like predicting the future is super tough because the technology itself enables use cases that we in this room haven't even thought of yet, right? So there's winners out there that don't exist, right? They're, they're going to show up in the next three to five years and completely take the market. Like, let, let's, 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 God, we can go through the decades of tech, right? Like, would, we were, we've been talking about utility. Remember we were talking about utility computing in the late 90s, early aughts? And then who would have said Amazon with S3 in 2006, 2007 was going to take the market? Like, no, no, no one saw that coming. In retrospect, it's like, oh, well, of course, you know, there's geniuses in armchair quarterbacks that are, that are retrospect saying, like, oh, of course. But, like, storage in the cloud in 2006, that's going to become the dominant cloud computing provider for the next decade or two decades. So you got to keep that wide, wide open, right, for now. Um, I will say, uh, based on the last 12 months of discussion, like the, the, the cloud providers are super, super aware of this as a threat because so many of the use cases of WASM are outside the cloud, right? They're on the edge or they're in the browser. And so they are scrambling to get a viable place to land these workloads and show the value of landing those workloads in the cloud. But it almost feels like a defensive move versus an offensive, here's a net new thing you can do by landing WASM in the cloud. So they're gonna try, and they're smart, and they have scale, they have cash, and so they'll do a good job at that. But um, I would also then say, the third thing I'd say is that the edge providers are really smart and are on this 
like nobody's business and you see the you know the fastlies the the vercells the cloud flares and go go through that whole category and then of course there's all the 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 end user products like cars and refrigerators and speakers and, and any sort of device where you have resource constraints where you can you want to make that device programmable that they're just gonna they're gonna embrace this and run with it and so that's as far as my crystal ball is going to go for tonight and two beers in. So. Yeah, and the saying goes, it's easy to predict the future when you're working on it. So that's, those are the only people that have a chance to win, right? So if you're not playing, then, you know, I think that at the end of the day, the community is going to win by default. You can just kind of sit back and do nothing. And when it's ready, you can just use it and you've won. You exerted zero effort and this thing is going to figure out and standardize itself. The use cases are going to clear up. The functionality is going to be there and you're just going to get to use it. The people that are winning today are already using WASM and they don't mention WASM at all. Right. right. They just say, hey, would you like to extend my platform? We're solving this problem for you. Exactly. Yeah, they what, say, yeah. here's my API, yeah. put your code here yeah. and the plugins, they've already won. Yeah. Right? So they're not distracted, they're focused on the user problem. So the cloud flares of the world, I mean, they talk about it because they need that platform because they're working on the standardization piece. But all the other players like Red Panda, they have a Kafka clone, they plan to extend that runtime by just using WASM. So I think they're going to win because for them, WASM is a feature. They're going to win by default. Or it's an enablement for a new use case that they can bring to their users, right? Yeah. And I think the big extreme is going to be, and I was just talking to a group here, and the ones that can imagine a new computer, that's going to be interesting. And then I'll give you an analogy. Um, think about, I don't know, before flight. There was no such thing as vacation, right? Nine months to get to another continent, you ain't staying for three days, right? You live there now. But when you can travel to another continent in six hours, then you can have a vacation industry where you can stay for three days. Speed, speed brings that to the equation. So when you look at WASM as that metaphorical airplane, when you get that type of infrastructure, that type of security boundaries, I know people are talking about the ability to split functionality and link it together in a code independent way that we never achieve with C being the lingua franca of that layer. Whoever figures that out, they're going to be able to produce this new platform. Unlike Lambda, unlike Cloud Foundry, unlike Heroku, they're going to be able to produce a new computer with a new programming paradigm and it's going to be fast as hell. That one is going to be super interesting because anyone willing to take that bet has an opportunity to win. So they actually are going to predict the future later. It's just a paid event. None of you all paid to come tonight. So uh, you, have to, you have to pay to hear the future. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you both. Let's give our uh, let's give our speakers a round of applause. Th thanks everyone for joining tonight and uh, please keep drinking and socializing uh, among all these other smart minds. Thanks again. <laughs>